Hi. Today we're starting off with another blast from the past. A while back, we talked about the stellar family and gave an introduction to stars. At the end of that episode, we mentioned that we would return to the topic and cover the lives of the stars in a future episode. We'll cover the lives of the stars in a future episode. White Dwarf, White Dwarf, what are your plans now that you've shed your planetary nebula? Are the rumors about our companion true? Well, that future is now. This is sure to be a stellar episode. Frederick's son would be proud. So it seems the best place to start with the lives of the stars is with their births. As the internet might put it, how is Star Babby formed? Well, basically, it all begins with stuff in space gathering. Okay, what stuff? Well, you know, gas and dust, that kind of stuff. You see, when a gas and dust cloud fall in love and they really begin to gather mass, gravity starts to take over. And then, bam. Boom. Kapow. Is that the... Oh. So, okay, now really all that means is that clump of space stuff is dense enough that hydrogen nuclei fuse into helium. And that's the basic process that keeps stars lit. Hotter stars burn brighter and use their fuel faster, meaning they have shorter lives. It's like that wise old saying, the light that burns twice as bright burns for half as long. From that wise old movie, Blade Runner? That's the one. Those particular stars, if you'll recall, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, are the blue and white ones. Here's where I was pointing them out on the episode six. Mm -hmm. And here's where I was pointing out the dimmer stars. So those putter along and last much longer. Hundreds of billions of years, in theory. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any experimental evidence as of yet. So those are the brightest and dimmest stars, but what about medium ones like our sun? So those stars fuse hydrogen to helium during the main sequence portion of their lives, about 10 billion years. Once such a star converts the hydrogen in the inner 10% of its core to helium, its layers expand. Well, that's what it sounds like if you speed it up over, over time. As the star grows bigger, it cools and enters what's called the red giant branch. You know, astronomers aren't really much for fancy names, right? I mean, what should we call that, Johnson? Oh, what, you mean the reddish giant star? Well, what about, you know, red giant? Fusion continues in a red giant's core until about 50% of it has become helium. It then starts converting helium nuclei into carbon nuclei. That kind of fusion requires hotter temperatures, so the star gets bluer. If you further recall episode 6, we talked about how temperature and color are related. Hotter things are bluer, colder things are redder. After about 100 million to 1 billion years, the sun-like star's mostly carbon and hydrogen core is surrounded by a helium shell, which itself is surrounded by a hydrogen shell. And the core isn't hot enough to fuse carbon, though. So that's about it for there. But the hydrogen and helium shells, on the other hand, continue to expand, along with any other outer layers of gas. The star begins to pulsate, and after another 100,000 years, it loses those outer layers of gas completely. All that's left is the carbon-oxygen core, which is what's known as a white dwarf. The white dwarf's radiation lights up the lost gas, creating what astronomers call a planetary nebula. Hey, what, what should we call that nebulous thing that looks like a planet? One of the most famous of these is the Ring Nebula in Lyra. Quite a turbulent life for those average stars. Massive stars, say more than eight times our sun's mass, go through the same cycle, but at an accelerated pace. The star loses its outer layers, but more violently. Some of these stars spew an intense stellar wind, like the binary system Eta Carinae. They also get hot enough to fuse more elements in their cores, creating neon, magnesium, silicon, and iron, the heaviest element a star can make. Again, the core begins to collapse under gravity and heats up. But because it can't fuse anymore, it bounces back into the outer layers. Creating a supernova. Kaboom! Was that it? More intense. Yes. The once-massive star leaves behind a neutron star or a black hole. 
if it was massive enough originally. Mm -hmm. And of course, the supernova blast itself lasts for weeks. Some of the brightest and nearest were even visible in the daytime skies on Earth. Not all stars fuse elements within their cores. Stars less massive than about half the sun's mass, such as brown dwarfs, those were the ones way at the bottom of the HR diagram. They don't get hot enough to fuse hydrogen, so instead they just kind of hang out until they radiate away all of their heat. They're just kind of, they're like the couch potato stars. I like that description. Yeah, I could have been an astronomy thing name or two. So anyway, those are the lives of the stars. Just like in real life, they're sometimes boring, sometimes explosive, but always illuminating. We'll talk more in depth about the deaths of the stars in a future episode. Till next time. Bye. <laughs> you got the first word. Where's the clapper? Oh, yeah, I gotta do that. It's part of our process. It is. We're method actors. Right there. The sun-like star is most... Is most bleh, bleh, bleh. We'll talk more in depth about the deaths of the stars in a future episode. What are you doing? Okay, yeah, I'm <laughs> short. Oh, don't feel bad. Till next time. Bye. 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 Do you want me to say bye more excitedly? I don't know. Goodbye. See ya. Oh, I usually do say see ya. I just wanted to get my voice in there. I see. Okay. <laughs>